Matthew Barrett. I'm a professor here at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I teach systematic theology, uh, though also some historical theology and philosophical theology. Uh, I'm uh, the host of the Credo podcast as well, but I'm very excited to have over here uh, Dr. Craig Carter uh, to join us. This is the second conversation we are having. Uh, so if you're watching this, do uh, listen and watch the first conversation where we talked, goodness, about a slew of issues, everything from hermeneutics to divine authorial intent uh, to so much more. In this second conversation, we are turning a corner and uh, we have the opportunity to uh, ask Dr. Carter here uh, since he is a theologian, about some uh, large, sometimes even difficult, sometimes even controversial uh, theological matters. And we want to start with natural theology. Why not? Uh, let's start with natural theology. Craig, can you, first of all, explain what natural theology is? Because I think Sometimes people have a knee-jerk reaction to natural theology, uh, but they don't exactly know what it is. Maybe they have a caricature in their mind, uh, even though natural theology has been something long held by uh, the Protestant tradition itself. So what is natural theology? Um, why is it the case that... Uh, Evangelicals in particular find it suspicious? How does that contrast with the Protestant heritage? Hmm. Well, natural theology is the investigation of what can be known about God by human reason, apart from special revelation. So natural theology is the, dis is the discipline that says uh, what we can know in this way. We, the, the Protestant scholastics would distinguish between general revelation and special revelation. So special revelation would be that which is contained in scripture. It comes supernaturally by inspiration. Uh, it contains things that you couldn't know any other way. But natural theology is based on general revelation and it is um, in principle open to all people. Um, and the fact that all people do not agree about natural theology doesn't mean it's not objectively true. It just means that people disagree about it for various reasons. So there is such a thing as natural theology, and um, it's biblical. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. Um, the world is made through the Logos. It, you know, John 1, commenting on Genesis 1, says that the world came into being by the word of God. And the word, or mogos, is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, who became flesh. So it, the, wor the world came into being through the logos. And the logos is a Greek philosophical term that means, um, in Stoic philosophy, it means the principle of rationality at the heart of the universe. The whole enterprise of Greek philosophy was predicated on the idea that the universe is rational. There is something about the universe that makes natural law work. Um, and, and that rationality can be described in various ways. But one of the ways it was described is logos. And so what you have in the prologue of John's gospel is the claim that the principle of rationality that makes the seasons follow in order, that makes uh, the world work what we call today the laws of nature, that all of this is because it was designed and created by God and that it was created with logos, it was created with reason. And human beings being created in the image of God have reason. And the reason in the human mind corresponds to the uh, rationality of the structure of creation, and this is why science is possible. So when, when the ancient pre-Socratic Greek philosophers invented philosophy, they at the same time invented natural science. So natural science and philosophy have gone together from, from the beginning. Um, so so natural, that's what natural theology is. It is 
what we can know about God um, from the use of human reason. And for all of, you, all of Christian history, from the second and third century church fathers, uh, like Justin Martyr, born in 100, maybe a decade after the death of the last apostle, right from him on, he engaged Platonic philosophy, and most of the fathers up till Augustine, most of them were engaged with the Platonist tradition in one way or another. And, they, and the Platonist tradition held that we could demonstrate the existence by reason of a first cause of the universe. So um, Christian theology has assumed that from the beginning. And then in the medieval period, there are the, the scholastic proofs for the existence of God as this idea gets worked out in greater detail. That doesn't change with the Reformation. The Protestant scholastics also uh, teach the proofs for the existence of God. And so if you pick up any book of Protestant scholastic theology from Maastricht to, uh, to uh, 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 any of them, Turretin, all the way through Hodge and Burkhoff, um, you always see proofs of the existence of God in the prolegomena, in the beginning. And now we live in a situation where natural theology has disappeared, completely disappeared. Um, if you look at the commonly used textbooks in most seminaries today, um, in evangelical seminaries, you find that very few of them treat the proofs for the existence of God at all. And very few of them treat uh, anything to do with natural theology. And I would suggest to you that this is a, um, this is an anomaly, this is a, a novelty, this is something that is recent, and, um, and it, it shouldn't be. There, we should recover natural theology. Hmm. Craig, do you think there's probably a variety of reasons for what you are calling its disappearance? Um, sometimes in the 20th century, the 21st century, uh, you can get the impression that uh, to be reformed is to be Vantilian. Um, can you speak to this? Because Vantil had something to say about natural theology, didn't he? And could you also just clarify what did it mean to be reformed when, say, theologians previously looked back at, say, the 16th and 17th centuries. What did, say, the 16th and 17th century reformed classics think about natural theology, and how does that differ from what uh, some think it means to be reformed today? Right. So the two, the two main influences on reformed theology in the 20th century would be Karl Barth and Cornelius Van Til. And both of them rejected natural theology um, decisively, and that has had a big effect on Reformed theology. The, the, the strange thing about Van Til, Bart is a little easier to understand because Bart is clearly um, more iconoclastic toward the past, he is more critical toward the tradition, and he is in some ways very modern. Um, but Van Til, teaching in a confessional conservative reform seminary um, under the Westminster standards. This is a curious case because, because for Van Til to reject natural theology means that he's rejecting the theology of the 16th and 17th century reform scholastics who wrote the Westminster standards. Um, so that, that's a problem. And, and it shouldn't require a Baptist to point it out. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> if, if you are, you at least have to justify a, a, such a departure from the tradition. You have to argue for it. You have to say, this is why I think it's true. And you have to be honest that I'm, what I'm saying here is different from what they said in the 17th century. But, but they don't do that. The, the Westminster folks don't, don't acknowledge that there's any problem. They don't acknowledge that there's any uh, discrepancy. They just simply go up about their work, and they they jump from they tend to jump from Calvin, who defines uh, the Reformed tradition for them, 
um, and they jump right from Calvin to, to Van Til, or, or maybe, maybe with a stopover in Amsterdam at the, um, with the, the neo-Calvinist movement. But basically, um, they skip right over the Reformed Scholastic uh, heritage. And so my question would be, how can you really confess the Reformed confessions if you are making such a major adjustment to the Reformed theology out of which those confessions came? And, and maybe you can. I'm not saying that it's impossible. What I'm saying is it certainly would need to be discussed. Craig, can you elaborate further on natural theology um, by first discussing the difference between, say, the preambles of the faith and articles of faith? And perhaps that can be a segue into uh, what you mentioned earlier. Uh, what are certain proofs for the existence of God? Okay, so um, natural theology is part of dogmatics. And um, the great tradition project that I'm engaged in, and the next book, as you know, is going to be on metaphysics the th to complete the trilogy. <clears throat> when you are, um, when you're trying to retrieve something, and we're trying to retrieve something, it's because we've lost something. So the great tradition project is partly, it's on one side of the coin, it's, it's, retrieval, or to use the fancy French word that we like to use, resourcement. But on the other side of the coin, it's a, an implicit critique of the contemporary culture. There is a critique of modernity inherent in the great tradition because, it, because natural theology has disappeared because of modernity, because of the attacks on the proofs for the existence of God launched by the Enlightenment thinkers that culminated in the work of David Hume, and then David Hume was followed by Immanuel Kant, um, who attempted to reconstruct uh, a basis for law and ethics and religion on the, using his critical philosophy. So what was going on there? Well, David Hume had supposedly, at least in Kant's estimation, David Hume had decisively refuted the um, arguments for the existence of God. And therefore, um, Kant understood what many do not understand who follow Kant. Kant understood, he was at least a as great enough philosopher to understand that if you remove the proofs for the existence of God, if you destroy natural theology, you are destroying the foundations of science and morality and, and religion. So he, he wanted to reconstruct a philosophy that would support those things without traditional natural philosophy, natural theology. So natural theology is based in classical metaphysics. And so the classical metaphysics that was um, attacked and left behind in the Enlightenment is, is bound up in, um, intricately with, with, um, with Christian theology, with, with dogmatic theology. It always has been all through the tradition from the second century up to the Enlightenment. And so when you, when you get rid of that, when you, when you take natural theology out of that mix altogether and you embrace some kind of post-Kantian constructivism, it changes theology. It has a ripple effect all through theology. And I believe that this, this, this rejection of natural theology, I believe that Kant's project to construct an alternative failed. And we see the failure of Kant in the 20th century, in the rise of relativism, skepticism, postmodernism, and so on. And so what we are witnessing, in my opinion, is a degeneration and um, a fall of culture. Now, people think that Western modernity is destined to go on and on forever. Um, but nothing goes on forever in terms of cultures. Um, in, in 410, when the barbarians sacked Rome, Rome had been in decline for many years. And in, you know, from a purely strategic perspective, it wasn't that surprising that the barbarians sacked Rome. Nevertheless, it was a tremendous cultural shock to the Roman elite. They, they, were, they fled Rome, many of them came to North Africa, and many of them were, were basically blaming Christianity for the, for the weakness of Rome that led to Rome's fall. 
And that was what prompted Augustine to write The City of God uh, in response to that. Just as those Romans, why were those Romans shocked? Well, they were shocked because they <coughs> believed the myth of Rome's eternal, eternality. They believed that Rome was eternal. They believed that Rome could not ever come to an end. For them, the ending of Rome was synonymous with the ending of civilization. And they just couldn't imagine that ever happening. Well, we today live in a similar culture. Modern Westerners believe that, that modern, the modern West is eternal. We believe it is, it is destined to go on forever. We equate it with civilization. If the modern West was to collapse, we think civilization would disappear. We think exactly like those Romans thought. And um, the idea that, that, that this civilization can erode its foundations, reject God, get rid of, of natural theology, and continue on as, as before, as if nothing had changed. This is, this is a partly hubris, uh, partly willful ignorance, and partly pride, but it's not going to happen. So there is a, an implicit cultural critique here, and I just want to say that for evangelicals, we need to remember that theology is never done in a vacuum. Theology is never done apart from the culture in which we live. So theology is always embedded in a culture that involves beliefs and values and practices and, and aspirations and so on. So when we talk about interpreting scripture and how we always bring metaphysical assumptions to the table when we do our exegesis, we, we need to understand that we get those metaphysical assumptions from the culture around us. We don't teach cult metaphysics in school, but we teach Darwinian science, and we teach materialism, and we teach, um, you know, we teach lots of things that, in, in fact, science has sort of replaced philosophy as the source of our natural theology. And so we, we have a culture in which there, the culture actually has a working natural theology. It's just different from the one that has uh, been part of Christianity for, for, for 1,600 years. So part of, the, part of the project of retrieving the great tradition involves not only building something, but tearing something down in order to build it. And what needs to be torn down is the bad metaphysics of modernity. And so, um, you know, I, if you want me to say a word about that, maybe sure. before we go on. Um, the average person, um, is taught in school that things change into other things by natural processes. That that's the way the world is. That, that there is no stability or, or design, that things don't really have permanent <coughs> natures, but that, that, that fish can turn into birds, that, 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 um, uh, that, that one species can turn into another by a natural process. So everything is flux. So in many ways, we're right back to Heraclitus, the, um, the ancient pre-Socratic Greek philosopher, um, that the whole of the cosmos is uh, made up of the same basic stuff, whether they, they used to call it atoms. We, we've split the atom. We know that the basic stuff is smaller than the atom, but we, we still have the same belief that that it's this basic stuff that's the same. So the stuff that makes up a tree and a star and a human being and a rock, it's all the same stuff. And it's always evolving. And so life can come out of non-life and human beings can come out of animals and one species can turn into another because everything is at root, at the bottom, of the bottom when you scientifically drill down to the components of things, and you see that what is the basic stuff that, that stuff that everything is made out of, that basic stuff is all the same, and that basic stuff can evolve into any shape or form. Well, that's a metaphysical worldview. That, that is a context in which you do theology. That is a context in which you think about God and God's relation to creatures and creatures in their relation to God. Um, I think that that metaphysics on the popular level, as it, as it stands, has to be uh, rejected and replaced. Um, it just, it's, it's not the metaphysics that was, that metaphysics was not behind the theology from the second century to the Enlightenment. 
If we want to go back and recapture classical Christian theology, we've got to, re we've got to also recapture the classical metaphysics that was bound up with it, which means we, can't, we can no longer hold to the, the modern metaphysics that has replaced the classical metaphysics, if I'm making myself clear. So I'm saying there is a, a tearing down and a building up. Um, but the metaphysics that most people take for granted is not compatible with the Christian doctrine of creation because there is no creation. And, and what I'm talking about here is not simply the creation-evolution controversy as we, as we think about it. Uh, it's more complicated than that and how we relate to science and so on. But, but at the fundamental metaphysical level, there, you know, what I've just described, this, everything is flux, is basically atomism and nominalism. We'll talk about these terms as we go along, but, but these things are not compatible with a Christian understanding of the world. And to clarify, Craig, you mean creation out of nothing in particular, because in the classical, in classical theology and the great tradition, it, it's a certain type of metaphysic that can explain creation out of nothing. To be, to be more specific, right? Yes. It's a certain understanding of God and his aseity and his goodness and his supreme generosity, as Thomas Aquinas might put it, that can alone explain creation out of nothing. Yes, creation out of nothing uh, is not part of the modern metaphysics. Uh, modern metaphysics resembles the mythological cultures uh, that surrounded Israel that the Old Testament corrected in that the, the modern metaphysics assumes that the cosmos is eternal and that it's constantly changing. Um, it, it does not assume that it had a beginning, nor does it assume that it had a design imprinted into it through a, an act by God to bring it into being. Also, it does not assume, modern metaphysics does not assume that um, that the being of creatures is radically dependent on the being of God and participates in the being of God. But rather, modern metaphysics sees the cosmos as radically autonomous. It is self-existent, eternal, depending on nothing but itself. And whereas classical metaphysics understands um, that God is being itself and Therefore, no creature has being itself in itself. No creature has being except as the gift of the creator. And so the doctrine of creation ex nihilo says that God graciously brings into being things that were not, that had no existence, and their being is dependent on his gift, not just for their origination, but for their ongoing preservation and maintenance. Um, this is a radically different conception of the universe than, than the modern secularist one. Mm -hmm. And we, we cannot, um, and so I would just challenge you that, you know, no matter what discipline you're in, uh, if, you're, if you're studying Old Testament, New Testament, church history, uh, practical theology, or systematic theology, you need to be uh, conscious of the metaphysical presuppositions you are employing or that were employed in the doctrines that you're depending on yes. to do your work. Um, because it's, this is something we all should care about. It's not just a specialized topic for the, the theologians to worry about. Yeah, Craig, sometimes uh, you, you've seen this too. The impression is given as if, well, metaphysics is something for the philosophers. Mm. Uh, and, and sometimes you'll hear that response, well, I'm a, I'm a biblical scholar. But when you go to Acts 17, that doesn't seem to be the way that the Apostle Paul acts when he enters into the Areopagus. Um, we think of the, even the language or the way he quotes their own. This is when, when he wants to describe this unknown God, he goes right to that, that concept of participation. In him we live and move and have our being. Um, which I suppose is a, Act 17 may be a, a good transition because you've mentioned metaphysics and how uh, behind the classical theology is an actual metaphysic that supports it 
that differs in a variety of ways from variations of metaphysics in modernity and after modernity. Uh, Acts 17, though, the Apostle Paul is very aware uh, that this is not simply a debate about God, but it's a debate about God and reality itself, uh, which uh, for him means he is quite conversant uh, with those on Mars Hill. Uh, he knows the history. He knows how some of the Stoics or Epicureans have even strayed from their prior history uh, and other Greek traditions. So that raises a, a, a colossal issue, I think. Uh, and it's this, how do we as Christians engage Greek philosophy? And Craig, maybe it'd be helpful here because you touch on this uh, briefly in some of your books. You talk about the Platonist tradition. You mentioned it in brief in our last conversation. Uh, but to be specific, because there's so much we could talk about, uh, but to be specific, realism in particular seems to be at the heart of what you're after when you contrast a classical metaphysic with a more modern one. We'll t we could talk about nominalism later. Uh, but let's, let's just begin by defining realism. And let me just throw some of the, the obvious uh, Greek philosophers at you and talk to us about the different ways that they described realism. Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus. There's others, of course, that we could mention as this evolves. But what are their core ideas? How, how, do the, how are they trying to refine this realist uh, outlook? Yes, I do think realism is at the heart of it. Um, if many of you have probably read Carl Truman's excellent book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and um, you could summarize that, that book by saying that um, the, the basic metaphysical issue um, that he identifies is the loss of realism. Um, and so that, that what I, my project is similar to Truman's project in the sense that he's focused specifically on anthropology. I'm focused more on the general metaphysical background behind that, but it's the same, it's the same basic project. So there is such a thing as the Platonist tradition. And up until the 19th century, everybody knew what the Platonist tradition was. They were, it was self-consciously a tradition. Um, it was based on the writings, the textual corpus of, of Plato, his dialogues. But the, but the Platonist tradition, as opposed to other schools of philosophy or other forms of thought in the ancient world, um, understood itself to be um, an ongoing tradition which has some things in common and then had some disagreements so you might think of some basic principles that they would hold in common, which allowed them to then get into uh, interesting, specific disagreements about things. Uh, that's how a tradition works. A, a tradition is not monolithic. A tradition is not simply the master dictating a, a, uh, a set of propositions to the student, the student then uh, believing those propositions and, and then just handing them on to another student and then get down through the centuries so that the tradition never changes. Um, actually, when a, when a tradition never changes at all, it's a sign that it's a dead tradition. Mm -hmm. it's, it's dying. But a tradition that changes so radically that you, know, you have philosopher A is repudiated completely by B, who is completely re rejected by C, well, that's not a tradition. Um, you have to have some continuity uh, as well as some disagreement and discussion. And in that sense, there was a continuous tradition from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle to the Middle Platonists to the academics to the Neoplatonists. <clears throat> and so the, 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 from Plato to Plotinus is a, like an 800-year, 700-800-year period uh, of a tradition. And this is the tradition that the Church Fathers encountered and, and got, uh, got involved with when they 
when they went out to do their work and of, uh, of theology. So this tradition was characterized by realism. <coughs> so what is realism? Well, realism is the belief in universals. And that sounds abstract, so what does that mean? Well, realism says that individual existing things, men, women, cows, trees, stones, things that exist in this world have natures. And so whatever you have, whatever your nature is, well, that's what makes you what you are. Natures are passed on in procreation. So elephants don't have baby giraffes, they have baby elephants. And the nature of a baby elephant is the same as the nature of a, of a, of a mother elephant. So the nature is what makes you what you are. Now the question is, is everything in the world that exists unique? Or can they be classified into groups? Well, we all know that in biology, we can classify species and genus and families and phylum and so on. So the question though is, are those, those categories that we impose on things just arbitrary? Are they just in our minds? Or are we putting all the elephants in the elephant category because they share a common nature? And realism says that the nature of a thing is what it is because it participates in a universal. Plato called them the forms. Now, it's hard for me to talk about this without a whiteboard. Um, <laughs> but the, the, um, the basic thing that you need to have in order for, for there to be universals, nature's participating in universals, is you have to have a two-tier conception of reality. There has to be the world of sense experience, the physical, material world that we experience through our five senses, the cosmos, and then there has to be another level of, ex of reality that is the realm of unchanging being, the realm of, that, is, that is not accessible to our senses, but which we can know intelligibly through our reason. And that, so reality is to be two-tiered. So if you were a, uh, an atomist, for example, in the ancient Greek world, then you would not be a Platonist, and, you would not, and you're, the reason you're not a Platonist is because you don't believe in that upper tier. You just believe in the sense world only. And so you would be a materialist. So integral to Platonism is an anti-materialist position. And Platonism assumes then that you have, you have the world of sense experience, you have the intelligible world, and that natures of things in this world participate in the, um, in the universals, in the, in the forms or whatever the, we choose to call them, in that super sens sensible world. And that, that is the essence of the Platonic metaphysics. That, that's really the, the guts of it. I know you don't have a whiteboard, so I'm, I'm really pushing you here, uh, but let's talk Plato's cave. Uh. <laughs> because I think so, in the end, um, if, we, if we move from this broad outline you've given, and we talk the specifics, how, how, what exactly does Plato mean? How does he use the allegory of the cave to make this point? And then we could transition to, to talk Aristotle. Because Aristotle right. falls in this tradition, as you've said, which sometimes gets overlooked, as if he's just against. But he actually falls in this tradition, though he wants to refine it, and at times he's going to critique Plato. Well, Alfred North Whitehead said all Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato, so we're going to talk a lot about Plato, and then we'll move very quickly through Aristotle uh, up, up to Aquinas. It won't take long once we've got the foundation laid here. Well, the allegory of the cave is Plato's way of talking about these two realms of, of, the, um, of the, the sensible realm and the, and the super sensible realm. And Plato believes, you, you must understand that Plato believes that the upper realm is reality. The lower realm is reality as well, but it reflects the upper. 
Um, so the realm of, that we dwell in is the realm of shadows, and the upper realm is the realm of bright sunlight. And this is why, uh, this, is, this is behind, by the way, C.S. Lewis is the title of his book, The Shadow Lands. C.S. Lewis is the greatest Christian Platonist of the 20th century. So he is, he is assuming that Platonism is, is true. So if that destroys your faith in C.S. Lewis, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> he, he is a Christian Platonist. So in, in, the ca in the cave allegory, the prisoners are chained along a wall and there's a, a fire and there is a wall that they can see, but their, their heads are positioned so they can only look straight ahead. And behind them, people are carrying, walking back and forth, carrying uh, puppets. And the puppets are casting, by the light of the fire, they're casting the shadows on the wall. And the prisoners are able to see the shadows, but not the puppets. Okay, so you get the general layout. So you've got a fire casting shadows on the wall. They're seeing these puppets. And the, as far as the prisoners know, this is all, all there is to reality. They, they, don't know about, they don't know about the people carrying the puppets. They don't know about the outside of the cave. All, they've lived their whole life there. They've never been outside. They've never seen the sun. They've only seen the fire. And they've only seen the shadows. Okay. And they become experts in the shadows. They become experts on the shadows. They predict when the shadow is going to come next. Uh, they predict if you see this kind of shadow, then that kind will come later or immediately afterwards. And they, they, be, they become fascinated by, their, by their, their little sphere of reality. But what Plato is trying to do is to create in our minds an image of people who we, we sort of feel sorry for because their, their experience is so limited and their, their world is so small, and yet to them it seems big. To them it seems normal. So, the, so one day, Plato says, one of the prisoners breaks free of his chains and stumbles up the path up to the cave entrance. And when he comes to the entrance of the cave, of course he's blinded by the bright sunshine. And the sun is in Plato's uh, allegory, the image of the form of the good. And maybe just to say a word about the form of the good. The form of the good in Plato's mind is the greatest of the forms and to, a, to an extent, and this, this will create metaphysical logical problems for Plato, but, but he's, he's kind of, he believes that the form of the good is that in which all the other forms somehow participate. And, and so this is where um, Plato's philosophy creates some problems because the idea of nature's participating in universals makes sense, but the idea of one form participating in another begins to, people begin to say that's not logically possible, there's a problem here, and that will lead to Aristotle's solution in a moment, which, which we'll come to that. But to, to stick with the cave for a minute, when the man comes out into the sunshine, he sees trees, he sees rocks, he sees cows, he sees uh, mountains and, and the blue sky, and he sees the sun illuminating everything. He is now beginning to see the realities of, whereas before he was only seeing the shadows. So in Plato's understanding, true wisdom is going beyond the shadows of this world to grasp the realities that are higher than this world and in which this world participates. When Christians read this analogy, this allegory, it was not much of a stretch for them to say, well, the sun is not the, the form of the good. That's obviously God. And God shines his light on the world, and by that light we see reality clearly. And without that reality, without that light, we don't see. We're caught in the darkness and in the shadows. And then all you need to, you know, go back and read the prologue to, to John's gospel and all through the gospel of John, the metaphor of light and how important it is. So when Christians would hear this allegory of the cave, they would say, well, obviously the sun is God. Obviously the, the prisoner has escaped into reality. And, and in Plato's story, if he goes back down into the cave, and he tries to tell the other prisoners what he has experienced, the reaction is very negative. They, they, they don't believe him. And then they get mad at him. 
And if he persists long enough, they would eventually kill him because they don't know about the outside world and hearing about the outside world is threatening to them because it, it threatens to destabilize and, and de decenter everything that they've experienced up till now. Uh, it calls everything into question. And if, 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 this is, if this story is true, then there couldn't possibly be any more important thing to do in life than to claw your way out of the cave into the, into the sunshine. And if you're comfortable with your life already and you don't want to try to break free of the chains and you don't want to try to get outside and you don't want to experience that blinding light, well, then you, you reject the whole thing. So Christian saw in Plato's allegory of the cave um, a, a basic metaphysical description of the reality that we inhabit. Now, how does Aristotle receive uh, Plato's theory? Well, Aristotle is temperamentally different from Plato. He is a natural scientist. He is interested in biology and geology and, and botany. He's, he's a person who is interested in facts and he's very practical <coughs> and he is very, um, very much interested in the world around us in this sensible world. But he is not crazy enough to deny the existence of universals. He knows there must be universals. So, but he, he's critical of Plato's placing the universals or the ideas or the forms in this third realm somewhere that's uh, not just uh, our experience or the upper realm, but somehow uh, in, in a reality of, of their own. He, so what he does is he says that the forms exist in individual existing things. So every horse has a horse form, and every horse is made up of form and matter. And so Aristotle develops a, a conception of, of beings as made up of form and matter, and the soul is the form of the human being. And so we, we, we all have a soul, and that soul is the form that goes with the matter to make up the individual person. And so since matter is different from person to person, we have individuals. So some people are tall, some are short, some are white, some are black, some are, are this and that, but they all have the same form of human. They all have a human soul. And this is the basis of us all being uh, one human race with, with equal dignity and, and, and so on. But that, that so Aristotle's idea is he retains metaphysical realism or classical realism, but he, he locates the forms in the individual things rather than in the, in the third realm. Now, when you come forward to Augustine, Augustine is going to come at this with a more developed theology, and Augustine is going to say, well, the forms are actually ideas in the mind of God. That, that's really where specifically of the Logos. And, the, um, and so that's, that view will carry forward to the Middle Ages and right up to Aquinas. And so Aquinas will, con will continue to hold the same idea. <clears throat> so what you have from Plato to Aristotle to Augustine to Aquinas is a consistent metaphysical realism. Mm -hmm. All of them believe in metaphysical realism. They have different views on where the forms are located but that's a disagreement within a tradition, okay? Um, so realism is, is the center of that. So <clears throat> Lloyd Gerson um, proposes a, a five-point heuristic to, that sort of defines the boundaries of plate, the, pla the platonic tradition, okay? So he says, uh, and he defines them negatively because that leaves room for disagreement about the positive expression of each one of these things. So there's, you have anti-materialism, so you've got to have the two-tier realm of reality. Anti-nominalism, which means you've got to have realism. Nominalism means that each individual thing does not participate in any universal, it just is an individual thing. So real anti-materialism, anti-nominalism, and anti-mechanism. Mechanism is that things move and change on their own, as opposed to being actualized by something, being changed by something. 
and then anti-skepticism and anti-relativism. Those five antis make up what Gerson calls Ur-Platonism. That, that is sort of your basic parameters of Platonism. You, if you don't affirm those five things, if, you don't, if you're not anti-materialist, anti-nominalist, anti-mechanist, anti-skeptic, anti-relativist, then if you, you, you are outside of the Platonist tradition. So everybody, from, everybody in the Platonist tradition, from Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the Middle Platonists, the Neoplatonists, Augustine, uh, the, middle, the, the main Augustinian fathers like Anselm, and all the way up to Aquinas, they're all part of that metaphysical tradition. They all, they all would, would fit in there somewhere. Now, Craig, I think Augustine in particular is important to focus on for a second. Uh, when you read Augustine's Confessions, though also the city of God, the city of God, it's striking that as Augustine is retelling this journey, which involves his own conversion, uh, he essentially says that stumbling onto the Platonist books, as he calls them, uh, was instrumental to correcting his mistaken misconception, his mistaken metaphysic, that proved a barrier to how he was reading Scripture and understanding God. In other words, he was more or less understanding God almost in elastic terms, as stretched out. And he, that not only led to other conundrums about the attributes of God, but even the problem of evil. How, how, is that, how did the Platonists correct that misconception of God so that when he came to the Scriptures afresh, he was no longer put off by the God of the Bible, or even offended by the God of the Bible, but now actually had a category for the God of the Bible? Well, um, as you say, uh, Platonism was important in Augustine's con conversion. Augustine was born uh, in a home where his mother was a Christian and his father was a pagan. But when he was 18, he left home and went off and became a Manichaean. And Manichaeanism was a Gnostic religion that had come from Persia and had infiltrated many parts of the Roman Empire. Manichaeanism was a form of materialism um, because Manichaeanism says that the, entire, the entirety of reality is a cosmos in which there is an eternal struggle between good and evil and matter is evil and spirit is good. So matter and spirit are two sides of the same coin, and they're at war perpetually. So when Augustine got to Milan, and can't go through his whole life story, but when he was being drawn back to Christianity, he was listening to Ambrose preach in Milan, and he was, um, he was finding it difficult to believe in the God of the Bible, and he was very attracted to Ambrose's allegorical preaching and is an allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament. And it was clear that, that Ambrose believed that God was not material, but in fact um, spiritual. The problem for Augustine was that he had no way to understand God as both real and non-material. He could understand how God could be material and real, some kind of finely diffused extended substance. He could see how God could be real if he was material. And he could see how you could say that if God's not material, he's not real. But he, what he could not get his mind around was this idea that seemed to be foundational to Christianity and the interpretation of the Bible, that God is not material and yet God is real. How can you understand that? So he, he, that's when he encountered probably some works by Plotinus, probably sections of the Aeneids. And what he gained from reading those books was a concept of an immaterial substance, a non-material substance that could be spoken of as real. And that helped him to get to, get to, to grasp the, what the Christian gospel is proclaiming, that God is real, but he is not part of this cosmos. 
the Bible talks about heaven, and the Bible talks about, you know, Isaiah and Daniel and, and many others, they see into the throne room of heaven. They see um, God on the throne. They see angels, Isaiah 6 and Daniel 7 and, and you know, Revelation 4 and, and so on and so forth. Well, the Bible presupposes a two-tier level a kind of reality, that there's a, a material world and a spiritual realm. And so Augustine found, when he, when he embraced Platonism, uh, which had this same two-tier conception of reality, it, it, it allowed him to leave his Manichaean materialism behind and to embrace Christianity. Because he didn't stop with Platonism. He, he, uh, he was critical of Platonism. He, he, he knew that Platonism was right about certain things. But he says uh, in, in Book 8 of the City of God, he says, I, I, I read in the books of the Platonists that, that there is one God who is creator. I, I read that, that there is, um, that there, you know, he, he describes all, all these points that I've just talked about that are good about Platonism. But then he says, I never read in those books that God became flesh and dwelt among us in order to redeem us from our sin. And so he, he could, he could, Platonism could give you a general metaphysical picture of the universe um, that was consistent with the Bible, but it, it never, it, it had no specific gospel of incarnation and redemption. And that was, what, that was why um, Augustine just sort of passed through Platonism, but didn't stop there. He went right into Christianity and, and embraced Christianity. So when we talk about Platonism as a metaphysics, we're not saying that Platonism replaces Christian theology as a whole. What we're saying is that Platonism is the metaphysical part, the background part, but then the Christian biblical special revelation of incarnation and redemption has to be added to that in order to have an adequate dogmatics. So it's not a question of either Platonism or Christianity. It's a question of certain aspects of Platonism fitting in with Christianity yeah. to make a, a dogmatic whole. Yeah. And Craig, uh, maybe it's important to underline that point, because if we fast forward to Protestant liberalism, you think of Adolf von Harnack, for example, uh, I mean, in many ways, Harnack is trying to persuade Christians uh, of something quite different, isn't he? That uh, actually Christianity has been corrupted uh, by this Greek metaphysic, which will lead Protestant liberals uh, like him and others to question, it's at times outright reject uh, certain facets of orthodox, of creedal orthodoxy from Nicaea to the creed of Chalcedon and so on. Right. This is what you're talking about is the Hellenization thesis. And it was popular in 19th century liberal uh, ethical religion and coming forward into the 20th century and the, the social gospel and so on. The Hellenization thesis is that the original um, uh, core of biblical message, that it was Jesus as an ethical teacher. It was Jesus as the, the one who, uh, who teaches us how to love our neighbor, and, and he had no metaphysical beliefs. He just, he just taught ethics. And, and they, they believe, and so you see this in, in Charles Sheldon's book, In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And so the Christianity is reduced to a moralistic, um, ethical religion of following Jesus as an ethical teacher. And, the, and, and Harnack claims that, that anything else, all this talk of metaphysics and creation ex nihilo and, and all this, and eventually even the Trinity disappears out of this. Um, uh, but he, he claims that's all the corruption of Greek philosophy. Um, but but I, I would just point out that the Bible itself teaches that reality is not limited to the material sphere. So you just think about, um, you know, Hebrews 10 talking about the, 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 what happens on earth in terms of Christ offering himself. You know, he, he's, he's now in the heavenly temple interceding on, on behalf of his people, so that the earthly temple and the heavenly temple, the earthly temple is a reflection of the heavenly temple. So there's a, 
all through the Bible, from the Genesis to Revelation, there's this concept of, of the reality of angels and heaven and, and spiritual realm and the earthly realm. They're parallel all through the time. And the Bible ends with the two coming together as the heavenly Jerusalem descends from heaven to, to be united to earth in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, so to, to claim that, that somehow this belief in a spiritual realm in addition to the material realm is some kind of uh, um, corruption of Greek philosophy, you know, just flies in the, in the face of what we, what we know to be biblical theology. Greg, can you also speak, I mean, you've elaborated um, on realism, and perhaps for those listening, uh, there's a number of sources they could pursue uh, that's by scholars like Gilson, who has written extensively on realism. Um, but could you elaborate, how is realism then to be contrasted with nominalism? And we may not have time to go into the whole history here. Uh, we see nominalism surface with someone like William of Ockham, but nominalism also surfaces uh, in the aftermath of modernity and certainly post-modernity. What is nominalism and why does it betray realism? Well, it's very simple. Nominalism is the denial that universals exist. So um, what's not simple is the, is the, the genealogy, the cultural um, history of, of how all this has happened. But I said earlier that, that a, a continuous platonic tradition that was realist and had those five characteristics existed all the way through from Plato to, um, to Augustine to Aquinas, and that tradition did not end, well, before I, before I say that, at the ap right after Aquinas' death in 1274, for the next two centuries, um, late medieval scholasticism was characterized by a falling apart of this Christian Platonist synthesis that we see in the work of Thomas Aquinas. And there was something called the rise of nominalism. So nominalism was promoted by William of Ockham. And William of Ockham was saying that, um, that God, God could do anything. His God's will is supreme. Aquinas had taught that, in the previous tradition, had taught that God creates the world a certain way according to his own being and character. And the way the world is has to be this way. The laws that are governing the, the reality of creation have to be the way they are because they're rooted in the being of God. But, the, but nominalism says, no, everything is just a matter of God's arbitrary will. So if God were to will that the Ten Commandments be changed, he could do so. If God were to will that murder should become legal, um, God could do so. There is no fixity about, there's nothing, there's nothing stable about the structure of reality. Nominalism really says that, that God is a God of sheer will, who wills certain things, and the only reason, if you ask why are things the way they are, it's just because of God's arbitrary will, and there's no, there's no use using your reason to try to figure out why, because the world is just the way it is, because it's a result of will. Well, that's a very different, uh, that is a, I would call, characterize that as, as the Augustinian Thomas tradition breaking apart and degenerating in the 14th, 15th century. And that's the background to the Reformation. The Reformation is, 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 is reacting, against, the reformers are reacting against this breakdown of the Augustinian Thomas synthesis, not against the Augustinian Thomas synthesis itself. And, and they're actually going back to try to recover the earlier tradition um, because of the rise of nominalism. Nominalism was so dominant at the time of Luther that every German university was dominated by nominalism except for one. When, when Calvin talks about the scholastics and how bad they are, he's specifically aiming his fire at the, uh, the faculty at the Sorbonne, which had rejected the Reformation and which was heavily nominalist. So we need to understand the Reformation as an anti-nominalist movement. 
um, which is not the usual historiography, but you will, but, but Reformation historians, as Dr. Barrett's new book will show coming out in May, um, this may not be general knowledge among non-specialists yet, but among real historians of the Reformation, it's increasingly being recognized that the reformers were reacting against nominalism. And we will, we will we see that explicitly in Peter, people like Peter Martyr, Martyr Vermigli and, and, and some of the Martin Bucer and some of the Philip Melanchthon, some of the second generation reformers, more so than we see it in Calvin. Um, but the point is that, that nominalism is not really compatible with Christianity. Now, that, so, and the Reformation was realist, and the Reformation promoted a continuation of the Augustinian Thomas synthesis as far as metaphysics is concerned, so that the Protestant scholastics continued that trend, and it wasn't until the Enlightenment that that was really dissolved, and then you have the, the dissolution of Protestant scholasticism, the rise of, of theological liberalism, and it's only in the 19th and 20th century that we see the full fruits of what was going on in late medieval period with Occam and nominalism, it's only in the 19th and 20th century that we see that worked out. And it's really only in the 20th century that we see the cultural consequences of it unleashed. So the sexual revolution of the second half of the 20th century is the putting into practice on a mass scale of certain philosophical ideas that um, have been percolating for centuries and which became dominant after human camp and gradually work their way down into the mass consciousness. And so the idea that there are no standards of morality, that there's no uh, fixed morality, uh, the idea that male and female are not, are not sexual, <coughs> biologically based parts of nature that can't be changed. I mean, these ideas have a, a philosophical, metaphysical ancestry. I would say that the crisis of Western civilization is primarily a metaphysical crisis. That, that, is, that is the crisis that we are embroiled in at the moment. So these abstract metaphysical ideas are anything but irrelevant. They are extremely relevant. And, and so in our situation, I believe, I believe that the, the crying need, the pressing need for Christian theology is for Christian theology to retrieve classical realist metaphysics and use that in doing dogmatic theology so that we can preserve um, the riches of our culture at a time when our culture is, is losing uh, its, even its historical memory of these things, um, let alone putting them into practice. Mm. Craig, as we turn the corner here and wrap up the discussion, I think it is wise of us to connect the dots between what you've been saying, specifically about natural theology and dogmatics <coughs> itself. Um, what is the connection between natural theology and revealed theology? But let, let me be more exact. How do we move from, say, the arguments for the existence of God to divine attributes? And then how does revealed theology, how should revealed theology actually confirm, perhaps even correct our thoughts, uh, supplement, but also validate and bring it to its full fruition? Uh, especially, uh, not just with the attributes, but ultimately with the Trinity and even the gospel itself. Yeah, see, these, these are big, giant questions, <laughs> and, and we only have a limited time, so we'll, we'll, I'll do my best. But the, um, just a, a word about something that, you know, is uh, something that perhaps is not known very well. Let's talk about the relationship of natural theology and revealed theology in dogmatics. Um, okay. The, the fourfold division of theology into biblical, historical, systematic, and practical is only about 200 years old. Yeah, that's right. uh, this, this idea originated in the German Research University, and it's what I referred to the other day as the conveyor belt uh, 
uh, definition of theology. You start with exegesis, and the biblical scholar do their thing, and then the conveyor belt moves down, and then the historians do their thing, and then the systematicians do their thing, and then the, then the practical theologians do about the implications. And, and it's a one-way directional thing where it begins with exegesis, it ends with practice, and that's the, that's the basis on which our seminary curriculum is set up today. It's, and the assumption is that each one of the scholars is a uh, specialist in a subdiscipline. And then even the disciplines themselves get broke. You know, there, there are lots of people who, if you ask them, what is your area of study, they'll say, um, they'll say the Persian period. You know, it, it's not even Old Testament anymore. It's much more specific than that. So in contrast to that, older theology was uh, uh, on the model of what I would call a spiral. So, you, so if you have exegesis that leads to doctrine, and then that leads to metaphysical uh, implications of doctrine, and then that metaphysical, those metaphysical ideas become the context in which further exegesis is done, and it goes around like this. Well, in natural theology, when we look at the proofs of the existence of God, let's take, for example, the Aristotelian proof. And I would recommend, by the way, Ed Faser's book, Five Proofs for the Existence of God. That's a very accessible way into a lot of good natural theology because what he does is he gives you five proofs and then he has a chapter on natural theology and how the attributes of God flow out of, of, of the, uh, the proofs themselves. So let's take the proof of, uh, if you look at the world and you see that everything in the world is a mixture of potentiality and actuality. I mean, this this. This is sort of discovered by Plato and Aristotle by reflecting on the problem of identity. How is it that something can, you know, you can, you can be a fertilized egg at one moment of your existence. You can be a fetus, you can be a baby, you can be an adolescent, you can be an adult, you can be an old person. Finally, you're a corpse. And they put you in the ground and they put a tombstone over, over you that has the name of, that you were given when you were born. You're the same person all the way through your life cycle, and yet you're so different in size and in ability and in consciousness and all of these things. It seems like everything about you changes, and yet you're the same person. How can that be? So um, everything is a mixture of potentiality and actuality. So an acorn is a an, is an potential oak tree, but it's not an actual oak tree. In order to become an oak tree, it has to be actual, its potential has to be actualized by something actual. There has to be actual sunshine, actual rain, actual minerals in the earth that actualize the potential of the oak, of the acorn to grow into a sapling and then into a tree. Well, if, if, if this seems to be a metaphysical principle that we can observe in the world around us that is Universal, we, we see it everywhere. Everything is a mixture of potentiality and actuality. And in order for our potentiality to be actualized, something outside of the thing needs to actualize it. So if you create a, if you, if you think about something being, um, if, if you think of a coffee cup sitting on a table, it could, it is potentially cold. It may be hot, but it's potentially cold. Um, and something has to actualize its potential. And so we think of causes. Everything, everything that, every time there's a change in reality, in the world, there's a cause of that change. And if we think of the causal chain, and I'm, I'm conscious that we only have a little bit of time, so I'm compressing this. Read Phaser to get the full explanation of this. But there's a, a a causal chain that works its way up. So something actual actualizes the potential of something, but it itself is a mixture of potentiality and actuality. So something is actualizing it, and something is actualizing that, and you keep going and going and going, and after a while you realize, wait a minute, this can't, this, this must terminate somewhere. It, we, we, it, there's got to be a beginning of actualization. Something has to actualize, something has to cause something, without itself being caused. Oh, why? Or nothing would be changing right now. So, there's a, there must be an unactualized actualizer, a first cause of the universe. 
something that is the cause of all that exists, but itself is not cause. Thomas Aquinas' proof talks about how God must be existence itself. His essence and his existence are the same thing. Well, once you do that, once you prove that there is an unactualized actualizer, a first cause, and so on, then you can ask, well, what must be true of this first cause in order for it to be what it must be in order for this world to exist? The basic philosophical question is, why is there something rather than nothing? Why do we exist? Why is there change? The, these questions are not esoteric or weird. They're just questions that should occur to any rational human being. And if, we, if, if the first cause is pure actuality with no potentiality, well, based on that, we can logically deduce a number of things that must be true of this, for, of this first cause. The first cause must be um, simple, non-composite, and that goes back to the, another argument that Fazer talks about, the Plotinus' argument from composition. The first cause must be pure act, must be perfect, it must be Im immutable, impassable, simple, and so on. You can string out a whole list of divine attributes. Okay, so you've got natural theology, you've got proofs of the existence of God, you've got attributes of the first cause. Now you go to scripture and you look at revealed theology and what do we find? We find that God is presented in scripture as the transcendent creator and sovereign Lord of history who alone is to be worshiped. And that God, the question is, how does that God, the God of the Bible, relate to the God who is the first, or the first cause? So even, don't even call it God, just say the first cause of reality. How does the God of the Bible relate to that? Was the God of the Bible created by the first cause? Is the God of the Bible part of the cosmos that results from the first cause? No. I don't think any reader of the Bible is going to conclude that. The, the God of the Bible, we're told, is the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who brought everything into being out of nothing. The God of the Bible must be the first cause. Well, now we have to put together what we know of the, of God, of the God of the Bible with the first cause. If you're, if you're Aristotle and you've proven that there's a first cause, you have not yet proven that that God is personal or that he speaks or acts to, to judge and save his people in history. You haven't proven any of that, but you know that from the Bible. So the great mystery of God is that the first cause of the universe, who is one perfect, simple, impassable, immutable, self-existent, and so on, is also, that we call the God of the philosophers, is also the God of Scripture who speaks and acts to judge and save his people in history, who becomes incarnate to redeem the human race from their sins. You may say, well, I find that hard to understand. Well, you're supposed to find that hard to understand. It's, it's not, it, this is a mystery. How can this God who is the first cause be the God who is the one who speaks and acts to save. Well, we don't know how or why, but we're told that this is true. And so just as we deduce from the facts of normal human existence and, and interaction, the existence of a first cause of the universe, so we are confronted with the facts of revealed theology as we find them on the pages of scripture. We, 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 don't, make these, we don't make this up. We, we, are, we are theologians who are dealing with facts. We're dealing with realities. And we believe as Christians that there is no final conflict or contradiction between the reality that we encounter with our five senses in the world and the reality of scripture. The book of nature and the book of scripture have the same author and divine authorial intent rules. And that's why they're unified just as the canon of scripture has one unified message, so the book of nature and the book of scripture has one unified message for exactly the same reason. Because just as the entire canon is determined by divine authorial intent, so the book of scripture and the book of nature are both determined by divine authorial intent. It's the same author, it's the same God, and it's the same intention. 
and he's saying the same reality and the same truth through both means, and they cohere together. That's what Christianity believes. And um, that's what you might call red-blooded, full, full-orbed Christianity. That's the, that's the real thing, as opposed to the watered-down kind of um, individualized personal therapy gospel that you often run into today that, is, that, is, uh, that, that makes no grand truth claims, but simply says, you know, this will help you to cope better with the tragedy of life if you believe this. That's not what we're called to do as, as theologians, is just to, just to kind of fit the gospel into the cultural slots that are available to it. We are here to, to talk about Christianity as it really is an account of reality as in total. It's, it's a total worldview or metaphysical worldview. It is a, it is a system that, that speaks to everything. It's about reality. It's not just about your personal feelings or your personal experience. It's about reality. And it's about, uh, and it's about the most real thing, which is God, ultimately. It's about all things in relation to him. Greg, I think one of the marvelous facets of what you've said is that when we look at the biblical authors themselves, they understand this. Oh, yes. When you look at Psalm 19, for example, <laughs> we love to jump to verses 8 and 9 and 10 and following about the law of the Lord and how perfect it is. But actually, the psalmist begins with the first six verses That's right. with natural theology. The heavens declare the glory of God. So there's a natural movement by the psalmist to observing what is seen and that leading to doxology and then moving to how has God revealed himself in the law, in the gospel, etc. cetera. Uh, if we were to come full circle, uh, even Paul again on Mars Hill, isn't it fascinating that before he gets the very, very end of that narrative to judgment and this mysterious man by whom God will judge the earth, the gospel, you can almost feel it coming uh, perhaps in the next conversation that wasn't recorded by Luke. But before Paul gets to that ending, what does he spend so much time doing? Establishing that this unknown God is a God who is Asai, the aseity of God. Philosophical theology. So Paul's a model. The psalmist is a model, but there are so many more. Mm. Well, just, just to, to follow up on that, Paul is often thought of as an exegete, and, and it it's true that Acts portrays him going into the synagogues and uh, on the first Sabbath day in a new city, reasons with the Jews from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So he does what we call exegetical biblical theology, but he's also, as you point out, a philosophical theologian. Um, apparently nobody told Paul about the fourfold division of theology. <laughs> he didn't realize he was supposed to stay in his lane. He, uh, he does both philosophical and exegetical theology. Yeah. I think that's one of the most surprising things about Acts 17 is you are used, especially as the way we read Paul today, we are used to Paul in the epistles, uh, Paul the exegete. And then we, we see Paul walk into the Areopagus and we realize Paul is actually a philosopher as well. And he has quite a bit of knowledge that then affects uh, his apologetic at that moment. I read a reference the other day to Paul's prepositional metaphysics, mm. the, uh, the metaphysics that flows from his use of prepositions. Yeah. Mm. You know, Christ is all, all, all things are in Christ and so on. The, the, yeah, um, if we read Paul for his metaphysics. Colossians 1, right? Colossians 1, we may, we may dis we will discover that um, he is not just making claims about your personal relationship to Jesus. He's making claims about reality as a whole. Yeah. There are so many resources that could be recommended. Uh, Dr. Carter has already hinted at a few of those um, at Fezer, Fazer's book. Um, a couple others that they may appreciate. Uh, John Webster has an essay on the immensity of God that uh, speaks of many of the things that Dr. Carter has referenced. Uh, 
You have also referenced Thomas Aquinas, uh, the Protestant scholastics of the 16th and 17th centuries did actually engage Thomas Aquinas uh, on a number of metaphysical issues. Um, his thought on contemplating God as so essential both to theology, the Christian life, but ultimately even uh, the end, the, the, the purpose of existence, the beatific vision where happiness is found, that too would be an excellent uh, exercise to explore what Dr. Carter uh, has said today. Thank you.